Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Ashwati Sunil from Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad. My topic for the day is a role of MRI in the evaluation of cellular and supracellular lesions. Aims to use magnetic resonance imaging as a modality to identify various lesions that arise from cellular tussica and supracellular region with, with histopathological correlation wherever necessary to document the incidence of optic nerve and cavernous sinus involvement. Introduction. The cellular and supracellular region is an anatomically complex area where a number of neoplastic, infectious, inflammatory, developmental, and vascular pathologies can occur. Magnetic resonance imaging has superseded other imaging techniques as a modality of choice for the evaluation of cellular and supracellular regions. Methodology, study design and place of study. A prospective study was carried out in the Department of Radio Diagnosis and Imaging at Osmania General Hospital, Hyderabad. Study subjects, 35 patients age ranging from 5 to 65 years with suspicion of cellular and supracellular lesions were referred from Department of Neurosurgery, Usmania General Hospital, Hyderabad. Duration of study, one year. MRI was performed for all patients using G1.5 Tesla scanner. Patients were placed in supine position in the MRI table and typical MRI protocols were done. Inclusion criteria, all patients with clinical suspicions of cellular or supracellular lesions. Exclusion criteria, patients with already treated cellular or supracellular lesions and patients con with contraindications to MRI. Now coming to the cases. Here, uh, axial and flare image is showing a hyperintense lesion, which is uh, showing intense homogeneous enhancement of post-contrast study. And there is wide associated widening of the cellar. The lesion on coronal, uh, uh, on coronal uh, post contrast T1 weighted image, there is infiltration of bilateral cavernous sinus with complete encasement of bilateral internal carotid artery with associated no narrowing of internal carotid artery. The lesion is also involving uh, bilateral optic nerves. This is a case of pituitary macroadenoma. Axial T2 weighted image showing a uh, T2 isointense lesion with few hypointense area. T1 weighted image shows multiple hyperintense area within the uh, lesion and shows blooming on GRE. On post-contrast study, heterogeneous enhancement of the lesion is seen. This is a case of pituitary macroadenoma with apoplexy. T1, T2, and flare hyperintense lesion, which is predominantly cystic, which is and occupying the supracellular region and ca causing compression of the third ventricle. On post-contrast, heterogeneous rim enhancement is seen. No restricted diffusion is seen on DWI. This is a case of craniopharyngioma. A T1 isointense, T2 iso to hyperintense lesion seen in the suprasellar region with no restricted diffusion. On post contrast, homogeneous enhancement is seen. This is a case in suprasellar meningioma. T1 hypointense, T2 hyperintense lesion suppressing on flare with restricted diffusion and DWI. This is a case of epidermoid cyst. T1 hyperintense lesion in the suprasellar region, which is heterogeneously hyperintense on T2, showing blooming on GRE and no restricted diffusion. A uh, few T1 hyperintense foci are seen in the cervical spaces in high right frontoparietal region. This is a case of a ruptured suprasellar dermoid cyst. A T1 T2 isointense thickening of the pituitary stalk, which on post contrast shows intense enhancement. This is a case of lymphocytic hypophysitis. T2 hyperintense lesion is seen in the suprasellar region, which is involving the pituitary stalk and left optic nerve. On post contrast study, a rim enhancement is seen. Multiple rim enhancing lesions are noted in visualized brain parenchyma. This is a case of suprasellar tuberculoma. A well defined pedunculated mass arising from the tuber cinarium which is projecting into the supracellular system. And the lesion is isointense to gray matter in T on T1 and T2 weighted imaging with no restricted diffusion. This is a case of hypothalamic hematoma. Results, out of the 35 cases evaluated, 41% were pituitary adenoma and 23% were craniopharyngioma. We also got two meningioma, two epidermoid, two uh, partial empty cella, one Rathke cleft cyst, one ruptured dermoid cyst, one lymphocytic hypophysitis, one hypothalamic hematoma, one suprasellar tubercloma, and one IC aneurysm. 
age distribution, 25% of the cellular or supracellular lesions were found in 36 to 45 year age group with pituitary macroadenoma being the most common pathology. A bimodal age distribution was found in craniopharyngioma, which included 5 to 15 years and 55 to 65 years. And it was co commonest in 5 to 15 years age group. Sex distribution. Female predominance was seen constituting 62.8% of cases. And pituitary adenoma was the most common lesion in both males and females, followed by craniopharyngioma. Optic nerve compression was seen in 54% of cases. 42% of the optic nerve compression were due to pituitary adenoma and 32% were due to craniopharyngioma. Bilateral optic nerve involvement, which is given by gray, predominated, followed by a right-sided involvement, which is given by blue, with only one case of left-sided uh, nerve compression, which was seen in supracellular tubercular. Cavernous sinus invasion was seen in 10 cases, 90% of which were due to pituitary macroadenoma. 45% of pituitary macroadenoma had bilateral involvement, 33% had right-sided involvement, and 22% had only left-sided involvement. Histopathological diagnosis was available for 28 cases, and MRI could accurately diagnose 96.4% cases. One case reported as subependymoma of third ventricle turned out to be craniopharyngioma. Conclusion. Pituitary macroadenomas are the most common cellular or supercellular lesion. Most commonly affected age group is 35 to, 35 to 45 years, and most commonly affected gender is female. Craniopharyngioma most commonly affects 5 to 15 year age group. Optic nerve involvement and cavernous sinus invasion are common in cellular or supercellular lesions, most commonly by pituitary macroadenoma. MRI is accurate in the diagnosis of most cellular or supercellular lesions. These are my references. Thank you.